Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Live, India's Voice to the World. I am Siddharth Bharadwaj. Coming up in the next 30 minutes. Prime Minister Modi returns to Delhi after successful visit to Bhutan. Earlier inaugurated a state-of-the-art hospital built with India's assistance in Thimphu. Hospital, a shining example of India-Bhutan partnership. At least 93 people killed, over 145 injured in one of the deadliest attacks at a concert hall in Moscow. Two alleged suspects detained. U.S. Congress averts government shutdown, passes $1.2 trillion bill. Key federal agencies will remain funded through September 30th. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi arrived in Delhi on Saturday after a successful state visit to Bhutan. Ending the special visit with yet another special gesture, the King of Bhutan, Jigme Kesa Namgyal Wangchuk and Prime Minister Shering Tobge both came to see off PM Modi at the airport. Earlier on Saturday, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, along with his Bhutanese counterpart, Shering Topge inaugurated the Gyalswen Jetson Pema Mother and Child Hospital in Thimphu. Well, it's a state-of-the-art hospital built with India's assistance. The newly constructed hospital would add value to the quality of mother and child health services in Bhutan. The facility stands as a shining example of India-Bhutan partnership in healthcare. PM Modi was conferred with Bhutan's highest civilian award during his visit to the neighboring country. PM Modi became the first foreign head of government to receive the honor on Friday. The award recognizes Prime Minister Modi's contribution to strengthening India-Bhutan friendship and his people-centric leadership. The Order of Truk Galpo is a lifetime achievement award and takes precedence over all orders, decorations and medals in Bhutan. On a two-day visit to the Himalayan Kingdom, Prime Minister Modi announced further support of 10,000 crore rupees or 1.25 billion US dollars to the neighboring country's 13th development plan. Prime Minister of Bhutan, Shering Topge, extended his gratitude to India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi for rupees 10,000 crore assistance to the Himalayan nation. Bhutan was honored to receive Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji on a two-day the state visit to Bhutan. The two-day state visit couldn't have gone any better. He was welcomed with open hearts by every citizen of Bhutan. And uh, this visit, this historic visit, is going to further strengthen the already strong relations between our two countries and our two people. India's External Affairs Minister, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, who is on a three nations visit, began his Singapore visit by paying homage to Netaji and the brave Indian National Army soldiers. Dr. S. Jai Shankar is on official visit to Malaysia, Singapore and the Philippines from March 23rd to March 27th at the invitation of his counterparts. The three nation visit of Jai Shankar will focus on enhancing bilateral relations and would provide an opportunity for engagement on regional issues of mutual concern. While delivering his lecture titled on Why Bharat Matters in Singapore, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar articulated that India had demonstrated a robust foreign policy approach amidst the challenges posed by COVID-19 pandemic. But once we started responding, other aspects of globalization were also visible. And that too told us why foreign policy mattered, uh, which was the producing vaccines itself. We were in a way at the end of a complex global supply chain. And every part of that chain, which was really spread across multiple countries, had to work 
if vaccines were to be delivered. And one of my most uh, memorable, I mean, I would say actually honestly stressful uh, uh, memories of that period were going uh, to the US uh, in, in uh, 2021 uh, with a binder this thick about all the orders that had been placed uh, across the world, but in one way or the other, which went through the US. And, you know, until those were cleared, really the global supply chain for vaccine production wouldn't work. Jay Shankar said that the current conflicts in Ukraine and the Red Sea have affected the supply chain, impacting India's energy requirements. Now, there was a time when conflicts could happen. It could happen somewhere else and we are in a different part of the world and, you know, its impact on us. Yes, we read about it in the newspaper, we saw it on the television and probably it stopped there. It may have had some consequences maybe on the markets. But if one looks today, uh, whether it is the conflict in Ukraine or what is today happening in the Red Sea, we are seeing actually uh, what is an actual or potential or an averted major disruption uh, of our daily routine and actually of our way of living. Uh, in our case, I mean, uh, as, as a major energy importer, uh, when the Ukraine conflict started, I mean, we saw the price of energy, price of oil virtually double in that period. Even when it settled down finally, uh, it was about 50% higher than what it was before the conflict started. Indian naval ship Kolkata, which was deployed for anti-piracy operations, arrived in Mumbai today with 35 Somali pirates on board. The pirates were handed over to the Yellow Gate Police. The ship was deployed in Gulf of Aden for anti-piracy operations. The Indian Navy intercepted the vessel with the destroyer INS Kolkata, confirming armed pirate activity on board. India's Chief of Naval Admiral R. Hari Kumar's staff held a press conference on the Operation Sankalp under which the rescue operation was conducted. He said that about 10 ships have been deployed in the region to keep the vessels safe from hijackings. I would say about 10 ships are present in this entire region uh, to counter all these, uh, to take part in all these three uh, tasks, anti-piracy, anti-hijacking, anti-missile and anti-drone. So, right from the uh, Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden to uh, the North Arabian Sea and to the uh, east coast of Somalia. So, this is the area that we are operating uh, where we have uh, deployed these ships. And because they are uh, deployed there, they are able to respond quickly whenever there is an attack or uh, some incident that is happening. Well, DD India correspondent Shishir Sela reports from Mumbai for more. The Indian naval ship has taken a big action against the piracy. The Indian naval ship INS Kolkata was in Gulf of Aden when they got the tip about the piracy operations. Well, this is INS Kolkata in the visuals you can see, which has carried out the anti-piracy operation in Gulf of Aden and have captured 35 Somali pirates in the region. When the INS Kolkata got the tip about this ship, they immediately swung into action and captured the ship. Well, these Somali pirates have actually captured the ship a couple of months back and they made the MS Ruin vessel as a main vessel and therefore they've started their anti-piracy operation across. It took nearly 40 hours for the Indian naval ship to capture vessel MS Ruin and later on 35 Somali pirates have been surrendered. Well, this entire, entire operation, along with INS Kolkata, INS Subhadra was also participated. Indian parachuters, the Marcos Commandos, were also part of the operation. They have been parachuted in the region, and later on, the entire anti-piracy operation was carried out. Well, currently, these Somalian pirates have been handed over to the local police, and the further action will be taken against those pirates here. But it's proof that how Indian Navy is committed to what safeguarding the trade routes also connecting various countries, which is quite important for the economic growth as well. Shishalar for DD India, Mumbai. In one of the deadliest attacks in Moscow, 
at least 93 people were killed and over 145 injured after the gunmen opened fire at the concert hall. The fire started with huge plumes of black smoke rising over the building, which can hold several thousand people and has hosted top international artists. Russian authorities now focus on providing help to the people. Meanwhile, two people suspected of carrying out the attack have been detained even as search for others who are believed to be at large continue. The governor of the Moscow region, Andrei Vorobyov, described the Friday's concert hall attack as a tragedy. He said that an operational headquarters has been set up. This is a tragedy. The burning area is very obvious. Firefighters are working hard on site. Further information will be released once the firefighters conclude their work. Investigators found weapons and other evidence after camouflage card gunmen opened fire at concert goers near Moscow on Friday. The Russian investigative committee released footage of a rifle lying on the ground and staff examining spare gun magazines and spent bullet casings at 6,200-seat Krukus City Hall in Krusnagorsk, where the attack occurred. Well, DD India correspondent Dasha Chernish Shoa joins us live from Moscow for more. Dasha, we just saw the visuals on the screen. They are scary. They are frightening. In this heinous act of crime, Dasha, for which the ISIL has taken responsibility, it poses a serious question regarding the security in and around the area where the attack took place. Two alleged suspects detained in the matter. Tell us something about the security in and around the area and what updates are you getting for us? Well, certainly the understanding is that security has been tightened actually all around the Russian capital as well as in other Russian regions. We understand the authorities are doing their utmost to make sure that the investigation is ongoing for the long time. They have remained tight-lipped. To this moment, we know that 11 people have been detained by the Russian investigative committee. Of them, four were directly involved into the shooting and the terrorist attack at the Krokos City Hall. Now, there has been uh, a report which has been confirmed by one of the Russian lawmakers that was the car chase in which the Renault was driven uh, from Moscow towards the Bryansk region. This is where it was turned upside down and where the authorities have managed to detain some of the men inside where they have found the weapons probably used during this act of terrorism. So security is one of the concerns for the Russian authorities at the moment. Measure have been uh, stepped up at the airports, at the railway stations, as well as mass events have been all called off in Russia, uh, in Russia's major cities, and obviously in the Russian capital, Moscow. Uh, as for the Moscovites, you can certainly feel the sense of nervousness among them. It is one of the first acts of terrorism in years, certainly one of the deadliest ones. And the, uh, the state of uh, nervousness is certainly something that you can feel in the air. People are also scared there, as it's one of the deadliest attacks which took place. Uh, Dasha, was there any warning from any authority that an attack like this was imminent? Also, how are the Russian authorities responding to the situation? Well, there was a warning coming two weeks ago from the U.S. Embassy in Moscow saying that there was the high risk of an act of terrorism to be committed in the Russian capital. Obviously, Moscow has brushed it off saying that if Washington knows something, then it has to be communicated to the relevant bodies of the Russian Federation. So now this has taken place and obviously in Russia many people are raising their eyebrows as to uh, why this has not been prevented. Uh, it could be telling about the poor communication between Moscow and Washington or it could be telling about uh, another act of terrorism that has been perpetrated and not known to the international uh, uh, to the international uh, agents. So to the moment, we understand that the UN Security Council has urged any country that has the information with regards to the perpetrated act of terrorism, how mm. it has been planned, how it has been plotted, to share that with Moscow so that Moscow can carry out this investigation.
All right, we'll leave it there, but we'll keep taking updates from you, Dasha. Thank you so much for your analysis. Now, moving on to the updates from Russia-Ukraine conflict. The Ukrainian forces shot down 31 of the 34 attack drones launched overnight by Russia over parts of central, southern and southeastern Ukraine. And a person was killed and two were wounded in Russia's Belgorod region in a Ukrainian drone attack on Saturday morning. The U.S. said... The U.S. said its forces conducted self-defense strikes against three Houthi underground weapons storage facilities in Houthi control areas of Yemen on Friday. In a statement posted to X, U.S. Central Command said the strikes targeted capabilities used by the Houthis to threaten and attack naval and merchant vessels in the region. The forces also destroyed four unmanned aerial vehicles, which is UAVs, launched by Houthi in self-defense. All right, and still to come on this edition of DD India Live. Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, reveals cancer diagnosis in a heartwarming video message. Says she is undergoing treatment after surgery. And we show you how the electronic voting machines have revolutionized the election process in India. Delight for cricket fans in IPL doubleheader today. Punjab Kings square off against Rishabh Pant's Delhi Capitals. While Pat Cummins, Sunrisers Hyderabad take on Kolkata Knight Riders. Real crackdown on corruption that the voters, the citizens of the country have been wanting and fighting for for decades or as the opposition claim an effort to cripple the opposition timing depends on the detection of the corruption then the timelines are fixed by the law i will say the opposition has crippled itself the manner in which they chose the timeline of response for all these notices that were coming to them in ed when you are arrested you are guilty until proven innocent now the twin condition is the court cannot give you bail until you are innocent. But how will the court be innocent? Because you don't go to the facts of the matter in the bail hearing. You're watching DD Near Life. I am Siddharth Bharadwaj. India has lodged protest with the German side on their comments on their internal events in India. Ministry of External Affairs summoned Deputy Head of Mission of German Embassy, George Enzweiler, today. Earlier, Germany reacted on the arrest of Delhi's Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal by Enforcement Directorate in the excise policy case. Well, let's get you the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic election in India. The EVMs or the electronic voting machines have revolutionized the election process in India and are now being used in almost all polls being conducted by the Election Commission of India. Now here's a report on the unique story of the EVMs. Electronic voting has become a hallmark of elections in India. Voting is done through the electronic voting machine or the EVM, which is a device used to electronically record and count votes. The Indian EVM system is also called ECI EVM, meaning an EVM specifically designed, manufactured indigenously and used as per the Election Commission's rule. EVMs were first used in the Parur Assembly constituency in the southern state of Kerala in 1982. They were used in all 543 lower house constituencies during the 2004 general elections. An EVM consists of the ballot unit and control unit. To make the system more transparent, 
the voter verifiable paper audit trail or VVPAT was introduced. It was used across all the constituencies during the 2019 general elections. So how does an EVM VVPAT work? People cast their vote by pressing the button on the ballot unit next to the name and symbol of the candidate of their choice. A paper slip showing the details of the candidates is generated and is visible for about 7 seconds through the transparent window of VVPAT. The ECI EVM can record a maximum of 2,000 votes. To better understand EVM's efficiency, it is important to look at how they fare in comparison to paper ballots, which were earlier used in general elections. Since voting is done by pressing a button, there is no invalid vote unlike the paper ballot system, in which votes may become invalid due to improper marking. An EVM can record up to four votes per minute, giving security forces ample time to respond to any booth capturing attempt. In the paper ballot system, there have been incidents of ballot boxes being stuffed with fraudulent votes. Counting of votes recorded in EVMs usually takes less than a day, while in paper ballot systems, manual counting can last for weeks. The use of EVMs reflects the evolution of the Indian electoral process with changing times and technology. In the US, more states are holding primary elections this weekend, including Louisiana and Missouri. Presumptive Republican candidate Donald Trump and Democrat current President Joe Biden don't have serious challenges left, but these elections are a chance to see how strongly voters in those states support them. Caroline Malone reports. Louisiana is a strongly Republican and Donald Trump supporting state. Their governor, Jeff Landry, is among them. Well, Trump won the state in the last presidential election in 2016 and 2020 with 58 percent of votes. He's likely to clinch Saturday's primary for the Republican Party with ease. Well, for the Democratic primary, there are options other than the current president, Joe Biden, which means they may take some votes away from him, including Marianne Williamson. Well, there are nearly three million registered voters in Louisiana, with just over a third of those turning up to vote in previous elections. Voting is open until 8 p.m. local time, with results due shortly afterwards. Well, on Saturday, there was also a Democratic primary in Missouri. Republicans already held their caucus there and chose Trump. For Democrats, there's also an uncommitted option on the ballot, so rather than choosing Biden as a sort of protest vote against his policy on Israel and concern over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And any kind of vote in that direction could signal how big a problem it continues to be for his campaign. Results there are due early next week. Well, there are now 149 days left until the Democratic National Convention, when Biden is likely to be officially nominated as their candidate, and 114 days until the Republicans hold theirs in Milwaukee. Caroline Malone in Washington for DD India. Meanwhile, US lawmakers passed on Saturday a $1.2 trillion spending package to avoid a government shutdown. The budget bill will keep the government funded for the next six months until the end of fiscal year. The vote on passage was 74 to 24. The U.S. Congress sent it to President Joe Biden to sign into law and avert a partial shutdown. Tonight we have funded the government with significant investments for parents and kids and small businesses and health care workers, military families and so much more. It's no small feat to get a package like this done in divided government. These past few months have shown yet again that when bipartisan has room to work, we can get the job done. And let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. Venezuela's opposition leader Marina Maria Corina Machado named Corina Yoris as a successor to take on President Nicolas Maduro in the country's presidential election in July. The announcement came following the arrest of two of Machado's close aides. Firefighters battled a massive blaze that destroyed several homes in Brooklyn, New York. The fire broke out in three-story house in the evening. More than 30 units and 135 firefighters and paramedics were called to respond to the situation. Two people, including a young boy, were killed and dozens were injured in a Texas highway crash when a cement truck veered head-on into a school bus carrying more than 40 children on a field trip. Britain's Princess of Wales has announced she has been diagnosed with cancer.
It follows weeks of speculation about her health after abdominal surgery earlier in the year. Deed India's Oli Barrett reports from London. We'll try to get Oli Barrett as soon as possible. Meanwhile, the news of cancer to Britain's Princess of Wales, Kate, dominated the front page of Britain's newspapers on Saturday. A number of UK's tabloids and broadsheets devoted entire front pages to the revelation. Rumours and gossips on social media, in newspapers and even some US talk shows have abounded since Kate underwent abdominal surgery in January. She had taken a leave of absence from royal engagements while she recovered from the surgery. Some sports news now where Chennai Super Kings beat Royal Challengers Bangalore by six wickets in the IPL opener at M. H. Dambaram Stadium, Chennai. RCB recovered 273 for six against CSK after opting to bat. Skipper Faf Duplessis, who scored 35 of 23, got his team off the blocks before the visitors collapsed to 78 for five. Anuj Rawat and Dinesh Karthik shared a 95-run standoff, 50 balls for the sixth wicket to give some respectability to the total. Mustafizur Rahman was the standout bowler for CSK, taking four wickets. In response, CSK got home in 18.4 overs after contributions from debutant Rachin Ravindra, seasoned Ajinkya Rahane, Shivam Dube and Ravindra Jadeja. Punjab Kings will take on Delhi Capitals in match two of the ongoing IPL 2024 season in Mullanpur in Chandigarh. Both the teams will hope to get start their campaign with a bang. Last season, the Shikhar Dhawan-led side finished 8th in the points table. Punjab have never clinched the trophy. They have reached final in 2014 edition, but lost to Kolkata Knight Riders. Two-time champion Kolkata Knight Riders will take on Sunrisers Hyderabad in their opening encounter at the Eden Gardens in Kolkata on Saturday. Led by the returning of Shreyas Iyer, KKR will be hoping for a better season this time out after missing out on the playoff spots in 2023. Australian pacer Mitchell Stark will also return after a gap of eight IPL seasons. The last time Stark featured in the IPL was in 2015. Playing for RCB, he had picked up 20 wickets in 13 games at an economy of 6.76. SRH, on the other hand, have assembled a strong core of foreign cricketers and will be hopeful that new captain Panth Pat Cummins can inspire the team to success in the upcoming season. And that's all for this edition of DD in Live. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD in Live.